Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to a brand new edition of Ring Respect Radio. Man, it's been way too long since I got to say that, but here we are, your video bros. I am Bobby Munson, and beside me, as always, he is the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. Papa Smokes, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. I should give a shout out to all my wrestling people and uh, just say that I'm very happy to be back on Ring Respect Radio. Let's get it going, Munson. You bet. We're going to get right down to it right away here. We are going to be talking about the whole card from Ric Flair's last match before we do that. Uh, if you want to check out Papa Smokes and I on a more regular basis, tune in Thursday nights on Twitch, Love Wrestling CA over on Twitch, where you can catch us doing major Love Wrestling each and every Thursday night. It's a great show, wonderful time. And we got a lot of things planned, a lot of guests. And I give that shout out because today there was MLW on showcase here during Ric Flair's last, uh, last match card. Uh, but let's get right down to it right off the hop. We got an introduction from Bob Cottle uh, as he introduced the Jim Crockett promotions for the night. And then the introduction to Tony Schiavone and David Crockett Jr. as the, uh, uh, I guess, the main uh, guys that are going to be doing commentary throughout the night. Uh, how did you feel about this opening? How it kicked things off? A little nostalgia there for you, Pop Smokes? For sure. I loved it, in fact. And uh, the whole idea that this show was brought forth by Jim Crockett promotions one more kick at the can, you know, they just, uh, he really gave me that, uh, gave me that nostalgic vibe having Bob Cottle there. Like I think the guy's in his nineties now, I remember him. He was one of the main wrestling announcers in the U S South there. And, and lots of people, uh, my age and older remember that guy. Um, he was the voice of wrestling for so, so many people. And I, to be honest, I didn't recognize his face at first because because I remember him as a much younger man. I remember him as kind of a 50-year-old man or something like that. And uh, once you hear that voice, though, you remember. It takes you right back to the exciting wrestling of the territory days. He's got one of those memorable voices, just like Papa Smokes himself. But the night kicked off right away, right into in-ring actions. And man, Papa Smokes, it started off strong with a tag team encounter. Uh, this was the Motor City Machine Guns taking on the American Wolves. Man, this one started off on. This was a match that everybody got right into. I think a very good choice for an opening match on this card. There was a lot of tag team multi-man matches, but these two teams, clearly a lot of experience between the two of them, a lot of history that, again, the commentary team had built up. Speaking of commentary, a different guest commentator on every single match on this card. In fact, Scott Diamore was the one that did this one. Uh, can you talk a little bit on his connection to these two teams, why he was chosen as the uh, choice for being the voice on this one? Yeah, for sure. Kind of like what you were alluding to, each announcer, or special guest announcer for each match had some connection to it, at least to uh, one or more of the competitors in that. And Scott Damore doing this one was a definite uh, tip of the hat back to the TNA Impact days of the uh, 2000s. And uh, obviously Motor City Machine Guns, uh, Alex Shelley and Chris Saban, one of the big tag teams in TNA between 2000 and 2010 or 11 kind of thing. Same with the American Wolves, had a huge run there. Both those teams, champions in TNA Impact, had some awesome matches back then. So bringing this back, just like revisiting an old favorite once again. Yeah, and this, I mean, the crowd was hot right away for these two teams, obviously. Uh, a lot of great experience. It was great to see uh, Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards working together again, especially. Uh, we got to see them really do a lot of that mat wrestling, a lot of that tandem stuff. But, man, uh, the Motor City Machine Guns come in there, and they're quicker, fast-paced. Alex Shelley doesn't miss a beat. Man, that guy is sharp inside that ring. A lot of back and forth, a lot of just wondering when this one was going to come to an end a few times when you're pretty certain you hit the finish. And then again, it didn't quite hit, get there. I like this match, Bob. Smokes. I thought this one, I, as soon as I saw this, I'm like, yeah, we're off to a kick-ass start here tonight. Can't wait to see what they got in store for us with the rest of the card. Yeah, no question. And uh, I like this tactic, putting a, a strong, exciting match as the first match. We know about that booking style Munson from uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling that we work for here in Saskatoon. Always, uh, Never starting the match, uh, sorry, never starting the card with a preliminary style match, but putting a, a pretty hot match first. I agree with this tactic, it, especially for live shows. It gets the crowd into it. It gets the crowd uh, invested in, in the art of wrestling and the art of uh, professional wrestling, grappling and all that. And uh, to put a hot match on first is awesome. 
the other thing I like about this match is that it's a styles clash. Even though these four guys can work together beautifully, the Motor, Motor City Machine Guns, like you said, all speed, a lot of technique, a lot of uh, high-flying stuff. And the American Wolves, that grappling, they bring it down to the mat. And they have a lot of good double team moves as well, which, as we know, is, is the key to success in tag team wrestling. So I love this Styles Clash, but the guy, it doesn't look like a clash when you watch it. The guys work beautifully together, and uh, this match is always going to be a good one. I, I knew it would be uh, the second I saw it was on this card. Yeah, and again, the Motor City Machine Guns picking up a great win, excellent match. Uh, like, we, yeah, I mean, we can't sing enough praises. It was interesting to see uh, the American Wolves working as the heels in this one as well, too, to see that different aspect from uh, Davy Richards, who we've seen as a clear-cut babyface over in MLW. So an interesting difference here, but worked very, very well. Again, uh, good way to, you know, here's the thing. I thought this card was laid out nicely in the sense that nothing really overshadowed anything. Uh, if there was anything that deflated the audience a little bit, it was picked right back up with other matches within the card. So it wasn't like they went hot, hot, hot. You had a big lull and then a main event or anything like this. It's, it, there was some consistency to the way this was put together as a whole as we're as we're going to talk about as we get to these other matches uh speaking of which we got to the next one and man i was excited when this one was announced i was excited when these guys came out not quite as excited by the time the finish came about uh we're talking about davy uh dave boy smith jr and killer cross uh this one featuring rich bokini from mlw on the commentary i called this an mlw showcase match okay i would say that there was other ways to showcase mlw and would be better ways to showcase MLW throughout this entire evening. But again, excited about Killer Cross, Davey Boy Smith Jr., who's been gone from the company for a period of time there because he went back to sign with WWE, I guess getting to come out as what well, as, as they said, somebody who was a long stay, somebody who had been in MLW from the past, taking on an MLW competitor of the future. Man, at first, this looked awesome. These guys went at it hard, a couple of big boys slugging it out. When they exchanged the German suit, duplexes it was a very fun different thing that we hadn't seen every day from everybody else until i saw the effects of what it did it seemed like davy boy smith jr got a little gassed from taking those hits and eventually that it started to seem like unless i i'm wrong and he was selling but i'm pretty sure it looked like he was pretty tuckered out after that and looking to get this one over with quickly once they had done the, that exchange of blows well, yeah, can you blame him, too, if you had to give Killer Cross 10 German suplexes in a row? That that, that would gas you out. I'm not sure. I, I notice what you mean about this match. I, I've also seen some of Davy Boy Smith Jr.'s training regimens online, and I, I have a hard time believing he would get gassed, but I, I have to uh, agree with you that, that this match lost some momentum throughout. I kind of put it down to maybe just... Uh, guys working together for the first time and haven't built up too much chemistry yet. But uh, I, I, on the positive side, this is two huge dudes letting loose on each other. And uh, I respect Davy Boy Smith Jr. a lot. I know oh, he yeah. does a, a lot of real grappling training and all that. Um, and Killer Cross is, is, is just a force in the wrestling world. Uh, he just seems to since he's been out of the big company he just seems to go wherever he wants he blows through like a hurricane with a scarlet bordeaux on his arm looking fine as usual and uh, these two are just a visual spectacle and i really like killer cross i think he's one of the best unsigned guys out there and uh having him on this card was a definite plus Oh, for sure. And again, I'm not I, I'm not trying to nitpick. It did seem like it lost that step. And again, I don't know, was Davey Boy having an off night kind of thing? Was he, you know, was there something acted up behind the scenes? Or was he just really selling it and making you believe that, you know, he had taken that much of a total shit kicking from Killer Cross at this point, plus lifting that big bastard that many times, that he was just selling the fact that, you know, he was down and out at that point. But it did, in doing that, it did kind of jeopardize a little bit of the finish. The finish seemed a little softer than maybe it should have been for the style of match and what these guys had given up until that point anyway. Uh, Killer Cross picking up a much-deserved win. But again, like you said, the visual of Killer Cross and Scarlett Bardot as a partnership uh, coming down to that ring, her at ringside with him kind of thing, and wherever he goes, he is just gold at the moment. And I know there's rumors speculating right now about him going back to the WWE with everything going on. 
But man, the selfish part of me wants him to stay independent right now and just go where Killer Cross wants to go. Yeah, I, I wish we could get him as a full time uh, contracted talent in MLW. Like, can you imagine some of the feuds we could get going and some nice programs with Killer Cross as a as an actual signed talent in MLW? I mean, there's a few other big guys there that could work with him, uh, heel or face, and uh, just the kind of star value he brings to uh, to a smaller company is just uh, invaluable. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, I hope big things for him with MLW, too. Maybe he won the Battle Riot. We'll find out soon enough when the new season kicks off. But until then, no spoilers, as usual. I think uh, you know, Munson. You know, don't you? No, I actually don't know who won the Battle Riot. You don't know? Riot. Okay, you don't, I don't know either. I, I know one of the surprise entrants, and that's the only result aside from possibly one match as we've seen something leaked. And I know both of us are very well aware of that. Shame, shame, MLW for letting us know on that one. But aside from that, I honestly, I have stayed away from spoilers. I know nothing about the Battle Riot right. other than one surprise entrant. And he could that surprise entrant could have won it too. I have no idea. So uh, moving on from there, we had a four-way dance, fatal four-way, whatever you want to call it there. Uh, this was a match. Uh, four guys, Ian Rick Bonnie on commentator. Number one contendership uh, for the Progress World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. I know I'm Takashita, I believe, is the pronunciation yeah, of the first competitor. So. Woo! Got one right for a change. Alan Angels, uh, Nick Wayne, and Jonathan Gresham. Uh, before we even talk about the match, which a lot of it's a very standard four-man match, um, Nick Wayne. Let's talk about Nick Wayne for a minute yeah. there. This is the first I've heard of or seen Nick Wayne. Talk about the legacy that comes from his family here, the heritage there. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know that he's the son of Buddy Wayne, the, the famous old, or is he even the grandson? Because Nick Wayne, didn't they say he's still a teenager? Or he's only he's 17, pretty young, yeah. 18. So to be yeah. Buddy Wayne, he might even be his grandson because I think Buddy Wayne was. Uh, active in the 60s 70s 80s kind of thing but uh not completely sure about that but uh you know these second and third generation wrestlers grow up in that environment possibly with the ring in their backyard or a, or a ring somewhere in their city that uh that, that their dad lets them play in and stuff like that they just soak up the business if they're interested in it and uh, we've talked about some of the wrestling families before the Vaughn Ericks, the Guerreros and such like that, where they, uh, the little kids are, are imitating and emulating the older uh, wrestlers in the ring from the time they can walk and from the time they can climb in the damn ring. So uh, they, obviously this kid has to be one of those too. And uh, it's not like he's adopted the kind of style that I'm normally interested in, but uh, he sure is good at it. And, uh, Think of yeah. what a blue chip stock that guy is at, at that age. Yeah. If he uh, calms it down a little bit and doesn't get hurt, this guy could be good. Think of him by the time, you know, in another eight years or something, he'll be 25. Like, <laughs> hey, yeah, could be a bright future. Yeah, you know what? And again, it just takes somebody to, you know, wise him up to the ways of the business and stuff like that and everything. I mean, he's already got the background. He can obviously work inside the ring. Nothing he did looked amateur or anything especially for a young kid i mean he was very slick at it again i understand about the the style and stuff like that of course but you know um i i thought he got a good look in in this matchup despite the match itself i thought the match was it, it was a, it was a fatal four-way is there much more we could say about it it yeah. was two guys lock out to get knocked out they come back in to break the pin two guys go at it it is back and forth almost to the point where it didn't really click with the crowd it didn't really click with me Obviously, there's another match similar to this later in the card that clicked a lot better, and it yeah. was probably just due to the style of the matchup uh, that we didn't get. There's a lot of clash of styles here, and it, I mean, it made me long for a, a singles Gresham match on the card as opposed to seeing him used in this way. Yeah, that would have been cool. I've been a big fan of John Gresham for a long time, and uh, uh, he's been in the wrestling news recently, and there's been some yeah. disparaging talk about John Gresham and stuff like that. I'm not having that. I'm not buying that. Uh, uh, he isn't a larger guy, but to me, he makes up for it in the excellence of his wrestling technique. Man, watch some of those matches of his in ROH. His, his, he uses moves I've never seen before. He uses transitions I've never seen before, and he does them so fast and so crisp that it's like, man, 
you're you're a master of your craft. I have to always tip my hat to John Gresham. He's he's got to be among the top uh, technical wrestlers of our time. Yeah, and I'll tip my hat to Court Bauer if he can get his ass over to MLW and start yeah. wrestling over there. Man, yeah. the matches he could have over at MLW yeah. that'd be sweet. But you guarantee that with the thing, way things are right now, you know the Dub and their money are going to have their uh, lips salivating over the prospects of bringing guys in, especially now that Triple H gets a little bit more say in who comes over to the Dub these days. So, as much as I want him in MLW, I feel the money might speak a little bit, uh, a little bit better over the way of the Dub. So we'll see how that pans out. Um, but on to the next match, Pop folks. We had one where Nick Aldis comes out first. He comes out for commentary. Nick Aldis always carrying himself like a star. Speaking of guys, I'd love to see an MLW. Nick Aldis, why don't you make an appearance over there yourself? Uh, this this is a cool match. This is back to tag team action on this one. And really speaking about getting a look in at new young talents, especially talents that come from a lineage, a background of professional wrestling. Uh, this one, we got the team of Kerry and Ricky Morton again. We te- uh, with, of course, Robert Gibson in their corner. Uh, we got to see this team over on MLW taking on uh, the Von Erics at one point in time. So it was great to get a look in at Kerry Morton, who's been very active in professional wrestling uh, since that time, really taking on a lot of opportunities in the independence at the moment. And then taking on the team of Brock Anderson and Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, with Arn Anderson at ringside. So a lot of nostalgia in this, a lot with showcasing a lot of the young up and coming talents that have that family lineage. Uh, there isn't, a wow factor about this tag match, but this was good. This was good from young guys getting into the business. These guys, they have a long future ahead of them. I think Brian Pillman Jr. looks like he comes out with more and more confidence each and every year. I mean, it's been a little while since I actually saw something with his involvement recently, but damn, he came out looking a lot better here than he did a couple of years ago when we were talking about him. I just, I see stardom, not stardom, but you know what I mean? He's, he's got a long way in this, in this business. I think that there's a lot to be said for him having a strong place with it. Well, I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think Tony Khan could have done a lot more with Brian Pillman Jr. He's just basically let him rot in catering the whole time he's been with that company. Whereas even he he was on the dark side of the ring episode and all that stuff, he had a little bit of buzz going and uh, and and everything and and he's never really gotten that breakout chance yet. And, and even in a or pardon me, even in MLW, he was uh, he was mid to bottom of the card kind of thing. He and, and he wasn't as skilled as he was, as he is now then, but. Um, I agree. He's come a long way. He's worked on his physique. He looks oh, good. Yeah. His presentation is very good. Brock Anderson is uh, is young, is green and all that. But, you know, he looks so much like his dad that you kind of have to take him seriously. And he's also emulating that style, too. So I like it. It's a throwback. It's fun for me. Uh, Kerry and Ricky Morton, like you said, we've seen a, a, couple, a one match at least of theirs from MLW TV and... Uh, the thing I like about Kerry Morton is he doesn't completely look the part of a pro wrestler yet, but you can tell that he's young and that Ricky's teaching him. He's not so hung up on moves like, say, a, a Nick Wayne is, where he's going a million miles an hour and trying to get lots of stuff in. You can see that that Kerry Morton understands psychology, understands uh, working with the crowd, interacting with the crowd, looking at them having them look at him that all that stuff you slow down and let them watch you and and show them some of your stuff but don't go a million miles an hour this is what i always hear the vets tell the younger wrestlers and i I think there's a there's a great truth to that too and uh carrie morton gets that he's got that interplay with the crowd and the interplay with the opponents as well he's not rushing through yeah, you bet. And like I, I, I can't stress it enough, the great look that all three of these young guys got in here. Again, I know, you, like you said, Brian Pillman Jr., Brock Anderson, uh, working over in AEW right now. I believe now they've started to start to use Brian, that, them in a tag team capacity. But again, okay. not, to the po- not to the point where they're you know up the ranks just yet kind of thing. I know Brian Pillman Jr. is definitely capable of more Brock Anderson will get there. I, I want to see more of Kerry Morton. I really do. I think that there's a lot to be said. He might not, like you said, might not look the part yet, but again, he's young, man. Like you go back and look at some of the guys that became the stars that they were. And when they were coming out at first, they didn't necessarily look the part from day one, but man, when they grew into it, 
they were gold. And I think Kerry Morton could be on to something, especially if he continues to listen to people like his old man there to get uh, get all the knowledge that he needs to be a true professional wrestler. Yeah, I think they said he's 22 or 23 years yeah. old. He's just getting his toe wet in the swimming pool right now, so to speak. So uh, imagine when that guy's 30 and has a bunch of matches under his belt. And this is the kind of card where he can get some exposure he can wrestle in front of a big crowd with lots of attention on it. That's a that's a thing for performers when you have big matches with lots of people are watching and there will be uh, media reports and uh, articles about it and everything. You got to keep your cool and uh, and have the more of those big matches you have, I think, the more uh, better able you are to deal with that kind of stuff. And, I think that'll come along with uh, for Kerry Morton too, especially with uh, help from uh, Ricky. Yeah, can't wait to see more from this kid moving forward. Uh, next up is that four-way match that I was talking about that I think had the crowd a lot more hot. Again, there were some things about this next match that I'll just I'll just say out the hot. Let's get the nitpicking out of the way. The cooperation was obvious in some of this, but it is a lucha match. We've become very accustomed to this over on MLW as of late, Bob and Smokes. So we had a four-way dance, Lucha style. Dombrowski, Dombrowski on uh, commentary. That was a nice touch there. Yeah. I was glad to see him getting an opportunity. Again, I got to say, MLW on display in this one, too. They didn't mention anything about it. But to me, Bandito recently on MLW. Tarus. Did I get it right this time, Pop? Yeah, Smokes? awesome. Yeah, the, I noticed they didn't get it right when they announced him in, but <laughs> I got some corrections in there. Uh, the Laredo kid, again, another one for MLW, again, in that middleweight division. And Ray Phoenix, a former MLW tag team champion himself. So MLW once again on display. And while I hadn't had the interest going into this too much, because, again, a four-way match and stuff like that, I think the crowd got me into this one a little bit, too. The more that they got drawn into it, the more I got drawn <laughs> into it. And, and it, it, we can't deny it. These, these guys are slick. They're slick at what they do, and there was a, there was some overall cool shit in the matchup. It was exciting. It got the crowd back pumped up like they did from that first match. So the crowd was very very hot once again for this one. And again, there's no harm in Ray Phoenix picking up a pinfall victory ever. Again, like this guy looks sharp. He's very very professional inside that ring. And again, it was a great win for him in, in this match. I thought so too. And and we you and I have watched a bunch of these lucha three and four and five way matches on MLW since they've been doing Azteca underground uh, tapings and all that. But this one kind of stood out to me a little bit. Uh, I don't know what it was. It was something special, some kind of chemistry these guys had together because uh, I imagine the, these are all pretty much top guys down in uh, AAA and in Mexico. So I'm sure they've all worked together numerous times and this match came together beautifully and, uh, I thought uh, I've always liked Laredo Kid. I haven't seen much of Taurus. He looks awesome. That's oh, the, does he ever? That's now the bigger guy. That guy's got some beef to him, and coming out there in that big Minotaur mask was was like, struck a cool entrance. Yeah. And then he did kind of more big guy stuff, but of course he's also agile and can do some ranas and everything else as well. But. Uh, and I liked Bandito, too. I, I've seen just a little bit of his stuff before. I know he's really, really hot in Mexico right now. And, uh, Ben, did, did you, uh, I'm sure you've seen this spot before, but I've never seen it done so fast and so good where the, uh, it looks like he's going to give somebody a huracarana, but then he uh, goes around to the uh, kind of DDT position and then legs around and arm around legs, and he's just yeah. spinning around uh, Taurus, I think. I've never seen anyone do that that fast and for that long. That, that was that was very impressive. Oh, the athleticism was far none in this one. Like, I mean, these guys are just awesome. And again, you talk about Taurus, like big boy. Again, he kind of reminds me of what uh, what the uh, people in the dub wanted to do back in the '90s with Mantar. Only they couldn't figure out how to do it properly. Instead, they had a uh, a, a much larger man that uh, didn't quite bring the impact here. But Taurus, on the other hand. I mean, there's a reason for him wearing the mask, being that he's a luchador when he gets in there. And, man, he's slick. He's slick, and he does big guy moves at the same time. Yeah. So he mixes it up with these guys. But I could see him mixing it up with some guys that were a bit beefier and stuff, too, and giving a good match. I like this one. I This was, I would say, of all the matches, this was the surprise one for me because I had the le you know, a lesser excitement level going into it. But coming out of it, I thought, damn, these guys put on a show. 
That's awesome. And I, I've, I've, you and I have talked uh, off the air before about uh, the wrestling lots of times, and I've always kind of had a soft spot for Lucha. I like it. I, when I was traveling in Mexico, I went to a couple of uh, sort of smaller independent shows there. I didn't know who anyone was, but uh, I like the culture around it, and I've always liked that. And uh, when we first started reviewing MLW and they started doing the Azteca stuff, there were some matches that weren't such good lucha, and I'm sure you remember some of the ones. Oh, yeah. I'm not trying to uh, criticize too much or anything like that. Sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't. But I've started to like Lucha more again. Like I, the the, I'm glad for this that that we've been seeing some on an American show because uh, uh, I don't get around much in my uh, my background wrestling watching to going through Lucha. There, there's lots of stuff I don't really know where to start in a way, but um, I, I'm loving that we're getting exposed to some of this. Like we've said all along, MLW likes to uh, 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 they like to program some stuff from different countries and with different styles. Hence the name Fusion. We're not talking about MLW Fusion right now, yeah. but uh, I'm talking about where we've watched some of this lucha lately, and uh, it's just colorful and it's fun and it's a bit different than uh, American wrestling. And this is what I like. It's a change. It's something different. A different flavor. And uh, you just get to try some once in a while and then uh, wait for the next time. Yeah, you bet. And this one got the crowd hot, as we were saying. So it was good to get these guys in front of. Again, I mean, the crowd obviously very familiar probably with Ray Phoenix and Bandito. But a great outing for Tarus and Laredo Kid in front of the North American audience. I normally wouldn't have got to see them. So excellent on that, all their parts. Uh, up next, this match. All right. All right. This was yeah. one I wanted to see. I needed to see. And I'm fucking glad I got to see Fapas, folks, because, again, anytime Jacob Fatu, first of all, gets an opportunity to be seen by people who haven't seen him, and I have heard nothing, nothing but positives from every single person that watched this that isn't an MLW follower, does not have a familiarity with Jacob Fatu, that this guy is the best kept secret in professional wrestling, and they're not fucking wrong. Like, I mean, this guy is one of the best kept secrets, and he shouldn't be. This guy needs to be on a grand stage. This was a very grand stage going for the Impact Wrestling Championship against Josh Alexander, who, again, you want to talk about guys who are slick inside the ring, great grapplers, that pure style that he brings to in-ring uh, action. He doesn't come out looking flashy or anything like that. He's wearing his singlet. He looks like a sports guy. He's a wrestling guy, and he's going to go up against one of the craziest, most vicious bastards in there. I remember as we were watching this thing live and Carl Carafel seeing the clip of uh, Fatu doing the moonsault to Mods Kruger onto the stretcher with the barbed wire, and he said, Holy shit, did that guy just do that to a regular stretcher that isn't gimmicked with actual barbed wire? And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much Jacob fought too yeah. when he go when he goes full crazy. I said, that's what he does. He he is a wild man. You're gonna see something else. And man, did we see a match here? Uh, I'm just gonna quickly mention we had Tom. <laughs> Hannah fan on commentary. This guy is the current Impact Wrestling uh, commentator over there. Uh, people would have known him as, uh, can't even remember, Tom, whatever the hell his name was in WWE because they love changing names, but that's where the world he came from. This is why that he was involved in this one was because of the fact that he is a current guy over there. Um, yeah, this match was awesome, and I kept thinking to myself because it was brought up during it that you know that Jacob Fatu is not going to walk away with a victory here tonight. And I said, as disappointing as that sounds to me, because I love Jacob Fatu, I'm not disappointed if he loses to Josh Alexander, because there's no harm in Jacob Fatu eating a loss to a guy that's that good and is the Impact World Heavyweight Champion at the same time, because Jacob Fatu wins and getting exposure. But they got themselves out of a pickle with this one. They really did. Having a run-in from, uh, I believe it was... Uh, an attack that came in here. Uh, was it not Cardona, put up Cardona and Brian Myers, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, I didn't the, know the other yeah. guy, but yeah. Yeah, and Matt Cardona mentioning something about how he was uh, it kind of almost ticked off that he was just supposed to be in the Battle Royal, that he was not any part of this card kind of thing. So that was his reason for attacking these two gentlemen. Um, all I can say is this was a great way of booking yourself out of a predicament of, uh, you know, keeping Jacob Fatu looking strong while also not having Josh Alexander take a loss in the, you know, as the champion of Impact Wrestling. Uh, at the same time, it opens up that door 
Does Matt Cardona want to eventually work with Jacob Fatu? Does that come over to MLW? Does Jacob Fatu now step over to some impact wrestling? And we know that there seems to be this, this connection lately there. Court Bowers kind of opened the door to impact wrestling and said, you know, let's, let's do some shit together. And hey, I'm excited about this prospect, Pop Smokes. Yeah, me too. And I was excited about this match too with, uh, you know, a hard ass versus hard ass. Both, again, different styles. Alexander shows you what his style is going to be with the singlet and the uh, head gear and all that stuff. He's a grappler. He's a, he's an amateur wrestler all the way. Jacob Fatu, not so much. He no. might know how to, but he doesn't use it in his pro wrestling style. He's a, he's a striking, battering beast the entire time. And, uh, man, they put on a good show with this. Uh, it was pretty evenly matched off the bat. Uh, Alexander took over in the middle and uh, Fatu, you know, that's another part of his game. Everybody talks about his, his vicious uh, offense all the time. He's a good bumper and a good seller too. And he was making Alexander look tough too. Anyone oh, that yeah. can bump around uh, the Simone Werewolf is looking pretty tough. And uh, I also was impressed with Alexander's uh, strength during this, too. He's a pretty big guy and all that, but uh, some of those throws, he was just, he had no problem with Fatu's big weight and uh, giving some crushing-looking suplexes in this, too. So I would say both guys got over quite well. Alexander doesn't really need it. He's the champion of, of a semi-major company, Fatu. We knew he wasn't going to win, but coming in and making this uh, making this shot against Josh, Josh Alexander, being booked in a world title match, it doesn't matter if he goes over. Who needs that belt, right? He just got some big uh, PR from this match, including a tweet from Mick Foley talking about uh, how awesome Jacob Fatu is. That'll get your name out there, too. Oh, yeah. So many people that follow him and, uh, and just the entire... Uh, the entire crew that was at this card, probably not everybody's worked together before, but now they have. And there was a certain amount of nostalgic interest in this card too. So whether or not uh, people got the entire pay-per-view and watched it or watched some highlights later or streamed it or whatever they did, there was some interest in this card. So quite a few eyeballs were on this. And uh, this is perfect for a guy like Jacob Faw too that's kind of like primed to just burst out and like uh, make it big on a bigger stage if that's what he wants and if uh, if he gets picked to do that. Yeah, it never hurts to have uh, guys like Bret Hart, Mick Foley, and The Undertaker sitting ringside watching you and praising what you're doing inside that squared circle. So, yeah. I mean, kudos to both these boys and kudos to whoever made the booking decision to keep them both looking strong by having the attack. Plus, again, it, it got heat. Matt Cardona attacking these guys and breaking up what was an excellent match got the right level of heat that it required and matt cardona is getting dangerously good at to get being being bad um i never w used to be a fan of matt cardona but as of late i've done a little bit of a 360 on cardona a bit especially with the way he conducts himself so i could i would love to see any involvement here even a tag match if we could do a follow-up somewhere down the line josh alexander and jacob fatu versus their attackers i mean carry the story out i would love to see it and I think Fatu and, and Cardona are both California guys. So having a spot like this is kind of good too because no doubt they'll run into each other in the future. And as fans like to do, they will remember that long-term stuff. But yeah, Fatu's got something against Cardona because Cardona interfered in and, and caused the disqualification in his world championship match against Josh Alexander. People, A lot of people will, will remember that from a... A, a specific card such as Ric Flair's last match that you remember where you saw that those other matches too and uh, that that he could follow both those guys well we got uh, two more matches exactly to talk about after this Papa Smokes before we get to that uh, very unique main event coming out from this card but uh, up, up next we had a match that I was very very excited about and I would say executed itself in a way that was strong very strong. Uh, it wasn't excellent, but it was very strong. Uh, the Von Erics finally getting to step outside of the world of MLW, uh, taking on the Briscoes. And again, Briscoe is probably one of the hottest tag teams in 
pro wrestling for like quite some time now. They've been having these great classic matches with FTR, probably two of the best matches of the year uh, that they had up against FTR. Uh, going up against the Von Eriks, and again, there was no slouching in this match. This was straight up hard hitting from both sides of the fence. Uh, again, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot more smash mouth than you get in some of these high flying matches that people are used to these days. But I liked it. This was a good, solid tag team matchup on this card, a good way to follow up that one on one singles matchup that we had before. And the Von Eriks finally getting a lookout from the rest of the world as well, too. Maybe they didn't quite get the accolades and praise the one Jacob fought too did. But again, I think that both uh, Marshall and Ross are worth their weight in gold and deserve to be seen by more eyes on this evening. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, and uh, that will only do the Vaughn Eriks good, too, because uh, they're still not at the top of their wrestling game yet. Both those guys are young, I think, and they need more time and more matches. And I, don't, I wonder even how many matches they have when they're signed to MLW. Like, I, I don't hear much about those guys doing independent shots outside of Major League Wrestling, but uh, uh, maybe they do. But at any rate... This was uh, the Briscoe brothers, a very experienced team, a 20-year-plus team, working with a younger team that's got something there, has got a, a connection to the fans, a connection to the past. Also, the Von Ericks, I think, look good. They're good-looking young men. They, they look athletic, they're big, they're strong, and they're good-looking dudes. The fans like that kind of stuff, and uh, I, I think uh, that they're good on any card. Now, this match with the Briscoe brothers, yeah, I would say it didn't go into the realm of greatness, but yet it was still a good exhibition for both these teams on this uh, Ric Flair's last match card. The Briscoes uh, got Ross uh, in, in the middle of the ring and uh, worked him for a long time. Ross was uh, the baby face selling for a long time. Briscoes had all kinds of cool moves and uh, couldn't put Ross away until he got the... Uh, the tag to Marshall. Marshall comes in like a house of fire and uh, you know that that claw hold is going to go on somebody and they had kind of a cool way to do it too in this match is Marshall put the claw on uh, Jay Briscoe and then they both kind of gave him like the uh, like a rock bottom type thing or an Uranagi type uh, choke slam to the ground and uh, we're trying almost got the pinfall out of that too but uh Eventually, Briscoe's just a little too wily for them, a little too experienced. They caught Ross with the uh, the froggy, and uh, that was a one, two, three, and and that I again, it's kind of like the uh, Jacob fought two match. There's there's no shame in losing this match because this is a a young team going against a, a classic uh, veteran experienced team. There's absolutely no shame in in losing this match. They did nothing but, the Von Erics did nothing but learn in this match and get exposure and eyeballs upon them. That's a win-win situation, in my opinion. And uh, I'm sure the Briscoes had a good time wrestling uh, a, a, a couple of guys that are from a wrestling's royal, one of the wrestling's royal families. Yeah, you bet, man. Uh, it was it was, it was, was good. I was good, very happy for the Von Eriks and very happy with the way this match went down. Uh, no complaints there. Uh, so the second last match of the evening prior to this one uh, going into the main event was the women's matchup, the only women's matchup on the card. Uh, it was Jordan Grace taking on Rachel Ellering and Donna Peraza. Uh, this one, I believe, was was this not for the uh, one of the women's titles? That yeah, was taken. Uh, Jordan Grace was Impact Knockouts Champion. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So again, um, I know a lot of people are not big fans of Jordan Grace, especially for some of the comments that she makes and stuff like that. But damn, if she doesn't look like a professional wrestler, I mean, she she's does. got she's got every bit the everything going for her when it comes to being a professional wrestler in that sense. Uh, a lot of people do enjoy a Rachel Ellering. She comes from a uh, wrestling background. I think. Uh, to me, some of her stuff seems like it's a long shot off of being there, ready for, you know, being one of the tops right now. Um, I, th I think there's just work. There's work for her to connect with the crowd and stuff like that, too. It's not quite fully c connecting yet, but nothing again. I mean, she, she's she got lots of years ahead of her kind of thing. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more great things from Rachel Ellering. <clears throat> 
Uh, Donna Peraza, however, you want to talk about somebody looking like a freaking star, acting like a star, everything about her. This has got to be one of the best unsigned women's talents in the professional wrestling world today. I can't say enough good things about what I think about her matchups, the way she conducts herself when she is a champion and everything like that. Uh, did I think they were going to book her to walk out of this one as the new champ? No, I didn't. I didn't expect any title changes on this card at all. I expected Jordan Grace to win. Uh, I was shocked when it seemed like Rachel Ellering picked up an injury there. It very much looked when they showed that replay of her foot rolling and stuff. I'm convinced she actually might have rolled it, sprained it, something along those lines, but kept herself going. So, I mean, kudos to Rachel Ellering for not giving up and being able to carry on and uh, do what she did there that night. Uh, they they kind of needed her there. I feel like she needed to be there to take that fall to Jordan Grace, which protects Diana Peraza at the same time, while at the same time keeping the belt on Jordan Grace. This this was good. It, it, it was a good match. Yeah, this one didn't hit home with me so well. Um, I, I like uh, Diana Peraza a whole bunch. She's one of those. Uh, she was trained down in OVW by Rip Rogers. That's the best training guy in the business, and. Uh, he also trained Serena Deeb and a few other excellent wrestlers uh, on the lady side of things. But, um, yeah, you said it all. Diana Peraza looks like a star, comes out looking like an absolute diva. And the thing is, she can back it up in the ring as well. She's such a, a skilled technical wrestler. She uses that Fujiwara armbar with extreme uh, positive results all the time. I love her stuff, and we've just seen her have a long title run in uh, Impact Wrestling. She had to have been champ for more than a year, and uh, everybody trying to chase her down. She wasn't giving up that title to nobody, but uh, Jordan Grace has it now. Yeah, I'm kind of also mixed on Jordan Grace. I like her presentation. I like the way she's got uh, the bodybuilder and power lifter uh, uh, physique to her. And there's not a lot of other uh, women wrestlers in the business right now that have a strong looking build like that. Um, I think she's okay as a pro wrestler, but uh, admittedly, I, I have a hard time forgetting some of the dumb shit she says on Twitter that is just absolutely mind blowing from a wrestler that's actually risen through the business fairly high through a, a, a short amount of time, through a, a matter of years, but my God. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about that. Uh, this match was okay. I, it kind of lost my attention a few times. I think the in, injury to Rachel Ellering early on in the match kind of shook the girls a little bit, might have changed the plan a little bit, and I think maybe... It's, they got a little confused as to what the new plan was. It, it just didn't come together quite as well as I think it could have after that early ankle injury to Rachel Ellering. So, uh, yeah, yeah, she, she made it through the match. She's tough, just like her dad, Paul, and uh, also a power lifter like her dad, Paul. But uh, this was okay, and she made it through to take that uh, fall at the end. Diana Perrazzo not going down, even to the champ, uh, Jordan Grace. We'll, we'll let Rachel take this pinfall, and uh, Grace retains, as, as we knew she would. There's going to be no sense in having a title change on a one-off card like this. And, uh, yeah, this is about all I have to say about the match. I, I think it could have been better, but it didn't turn out so well tonight. That's fair enough, Papa Smokes. We'll move on from there. And we got one lot more to talk about before we wrap things up here on Ring Respect Radio. We're going to do our damnedest, but it is time for the main event of the evening. This one is Ric Flair's last match, the last time he is walking that that rampway down to the ring. Oh, man, Papa Smokes, this is, this is tough. <laughs> I'm sorry, but... Uh, Ric Flair and Andrade El Idolo take it on Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. Man, it was rough to watch Ric Flair in this matchup. Um, I'll, I'll say one positive right off the hop. Jeff Jarrett was the surprise of this matchup, both in the way him and Karen Angle were getting heat throughout the entire time. Uh, but Rick, Jeff Jarrett looks great right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, damn, does he look good. He looks like he could get right back in there and probably be all right mixing it up with, with some of the people today. 
No, he was pretty good in this match. I thought he looked yeah. good. His body looked awesome. I don't know yeah. how old he is. He's he's got to be in his early sixties at least. And yeah, uh, he looks like he's been working out hard. Did you see those packs and everything? Yeah. He looked excellent, and uh, he's a master heat getter as well. A, a Tennessee uh, heel for for a lot of his career. Those guys. That had the fans trying to stab them and shoot them and attack them and, and run them off the road in their cars. Like, this is the era he comes from, as well as Ric Flair. And uh, I, I thought they did a great job of antagonizing the fans at ringside. Karen was funny. And, yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah but, uh, uh, and Jay Lethal, always a fantastic talent. I mean, this oh, guy, yeah. we, we saw that Flair was working out with him before the match and all that stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't have to praise Jay Lethal anymore. I, he's one of the best uh, all-around wrestlers we got in the business today. But when you talked about Ric Flair walking that aisle for one last match, I remember just thinking, okay, how's he going to look in this match? And when he walked out there with, he had that nice old white and pink robe on. We all recognize that one, but he just didn't look good, man. Like he looked like a really, really, really old man. He looked like a 95 year old man. And even that slick $25,000 rhinestone robe that he had on, kind of the sash for it like looked all sloppy and it, it didn't look like it was sitting on him that good like he looked like a, an old man in a in a nursing home with his house coat on getting up to go to the bathroom kind of thing i'm not trying to be mean about this i, I no, respect no. rick flair a whole bunch but that first visual i gotta say was kind of shocking where he looked rumpled he looked a bit disheveled and he looked a bit confused coming out there and it was like oh my god i'm not sure if this is such a good idea yeah and then the one mention we didn't mention was andrade and i felt he was muted in this matchup for someone with the talent that he has like i just haven't seen as much out of him as i'd like to and i really i honestly thought that the way they were going to book this one was to have uh lethal and jared get a lot of heat on andrade allow andrade to carry a lot of this match inevitably get that hot tag, let Flair come in, give a couple of those classic Flair moments, maybe one or two bumps that Flair is notorious for kind of thing that would really pop the crowd and then go from there. But it, it wasn't the case. Flair took <clears throat> most of this while Andrade did not much. <laughs> like Andrade was muted for a good majority of this match and Flair got, got color. I, I was afraid yeah. at this point. And not in a good way. I was uncomfortable in this fact that it seemed like I was watching an old man bleeding to death at this point because how much can he afford to lose without having any complications? I, I was worried for the guy. It made me uneasy. And already the match was kind of uneasy to watch because even watching Flair try to move around there and the guys having to adjust what they would normally be like in order to be able to sell to him, it, it was not good. It really was. It, it was a shame because, again, it's such a legacy in Ric Flair. You'd love to see him go out with, with a classic, and this is a classic for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, too. And Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, you know, a lot of people have some negative feelings personally about Ric Flair <laughs> over some stories that have come up on documentaries recently and all that. I'm going to try and stay away from that. I've always admired Flair's in-ring work and his skill as a wrestler, but in this match, he he wasn't connecting with the crowd, and that that's his bread and butter too. Is yelling to the crowd and wooing to the crowd and all that stuff, and he seemed like he was inside himself a little bit, like in his mind. And uh, there were a few moments he tried to do the the strut, and that wasn't going so well. Like that didn't look like Ric Flair strut at all. And it was like, man, if you can't do that anymore, you shouldn't be having a match. No. And I mean, it went okay. There were no huge botches or anything like that. Flair took a full standing vertical suplex, which was a pretty hard bump. Like, yeah. And uh, he didn't uh, come off the top rope or anything like that, but. He got through it okay, and his, his chops were decent, and he got the figure four on barely a couple of times. And uh, But, yeah, this was, uh, let's just say I was glad that they did this show and that he had a last match. 
I hope, a real, actual last match with some fanfare. He held a card and brought up some younger talent and had a bunch of other good matches, got some other guys over. That's pretty awesome. That's every wrestler's job, too. But I would rather live with the memories I have of, of Ric Flair's great matches than ever think about this match again. And uh, I, I really just hope this is it because it, it, it should be. It really should be. Yeah, and again, like while we can sit there and say that, there were a lot of positives from the card as a whole. Again, not every match clicked, but again, it was a lot of faces that maybe haven't got that exposure in front of a bigger market. So you label something Ric Flair's last match, and you're going to bring in a lot of people who don't watch. Uh, they don't watch AEW. They don't watch Impact. They don't watch MLW. Uh, they're not familiar with a lot of these names. But maybe that was the best part about this, is that a lot of those names got seen by people who aren't used to them and now their opportunities are going to shine and they'll get to see that um yeah again this last matchup it it was it was hard to watch but again we'll we'll remember all the classics the great stuff and stuff like that that i'm sure we're going to talk about in depth here on an upcoming episode of ring respect radio so that we can remember those uh those a lot stronger matches that came throughout the career uh it, it would be tough i mean son of a bitch like i'm I'm pushing 40 and I couldn't imagine having to go in there and do this yet. I'm not trying to take a take away by any means and, you know, throw shade at me and say like, you know, the guy's how old and stuff like that. I get it. It's just, it's like me watching even like, even watching a guy like the undertaker. Yeah. I mean, it takes away the mystique of what they once were when you expose the weaknesses of what they've become as they've gotten older. That's beautifully put too. And uh, I think a lot of these guys, based on their reputation can still draw money that's the thing so the promoters want to use that to to still draw money and the guys the wrestlers themselves want to say well i still got it i can do less stuff and still do a good match but you still have to do some stuff and you have to be able to do it and uh the, i'm not sure i i'm not even really that sure what the reaction generally of this match was i know a lot of people felt the same we did from what I could tell on social media that Flair doesn't look so good. And this was just maybe not the best way to cap off his legacy. But at the same time, just like I said before, I love that he threw this card, got some younger wrestlers over. And I like that he didn't just fade away and ride off into the sunset. He had one more match. He's one of the warriors of our time. I never thought Flair would stop. I thought he'd be having matches until he died. It's just that he hasn't died yet. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, and a lot of people thought he was going to die in the ring. He even did that one little spot where he kind of faked that he was having a heart attack outside. Yeah. Ring. It's yeah. like, wow. Wow. That, that's Rick. He'll go for it, man. But what a career and uh, and what a night. And, and yeah, it, it it's not like him when he was younger, but that's the same of all of us, right? And this was the cap on the career. This was the, uh, the final note, so to speak. So that's it. We got a career for Ric Flair. You bet. And like I said before, we are going to be talking about his career more in depth on one of our upcoming, if not the next episode of Ring Respect Radio. Uh, it has been marvelous getting an opportunity to do this again. As I mentioned before, you can catch Papa Smokes and I on Thursday nights over on uh, Twitch slash Love Wrestling CA, where we do major love wrestling. That's where we've taken all the MLW reviewing over to and a lot of the interviews as well. But because this falls outside of that spectrum, we thought this was a perfect opportunity to get back on the Ring Respect fold. Uh, we're going to have a lot planned uh, coming up for all of you guys here on the video bros network in the near future so we're gonna have a lot more content coming your way uh so papa smokes uh before we head out uh just like we do on thursday nights uh where can the good fans find you okay i'm on elon musk's twitter Funland at smokes underscore papa and i'm on twitch at papa underscore smokes underscore that's it. Check that man out and uh, give him a like, give him a follow. Also, give us a subscribe here on YouTube. Helps us out a ton. We know a lot of people are viewing but haven't subscribed just yet. Take that one little extra minute out of your day and subscribe to our channel here and get out the word about Ring Respect Radio on the Video Bros Network. But until next time, I'm Bobby Munson. He's Papa Spokes. We'll see you soon, friends. Dark cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back. 
from the place where 